Professor Berg wanted us to uh, talk a little bit about uh, protein stability today. And uh, he had, uh, in his outline of the lecture, he starts out with uh, material on the uh, general makeup of proteins. I'm sure those of you who have gone through uh, the biochem courses will <laughs> find this very old hat but perhaps it would not be amiss a to uh, review it briefly. Proteins, of course, are very large molecules varying from uh, oh, several thousand molecular weight up to a few million in molecular weight for the uh, larger ones. They are built up, as you know, of uh, polypeptides which in turn are put together from uh, amino acids using uh, this general scheme in which we have the carboxyl end of one amino acid reacting with the amino, amino end of the other. The uh, skeleton, in other words, of this polypeptide is a series of amide linkages with the residual chain of the amino acids sticking out first on one side and then the other side of the uh, peptide. The, uh, and of course, uh, you can see that with some uh, 20 or perhaps a few more naturally occurring amino acids, the possibility for uh, variation of uh, polypeptides and hence of the proteins themselves is uh, practically limitless. Uh, indeed, it's a, an amazing thing that we ever come out with uh, exactly the same structure, uh, although uh, we have to rely on the uh, uh, specificity of the protein building systems to uh, make the uh, polypeptides and the proteins themselves uh, very carefully and uh, thus uh, essentially the same for reaction purposes. The uh, polypeptides, again, are put together to make the protein itself by a number of different uh, linkages. One that is quite uh, important is the uh, bonding between the uh, sulfur or um, sulfhydro groups. We have certain amino acids in which we get uh, this type of linkage, and uh, this is very uh, easily oxidized and reduced, and if it approaches a similar sulfhydryl group in another polypeptide, you can uh, lose the uh, protons and wind up with what's called a dithio linkage. Uh, this, you remember, is the uh, mechanism of the uh, uh, oxidation and reduction in lipoic acid. Only here we have a, a cyclical structure involved in the forming the proteins from uh, polypeptides. We're involved with uh, much larger units. Also, of course, uh, because we do have uh, amino acids that have an excess of carboxylic acid groups, uh, aspartic acid being an example, uh, glutamic, and we have uh, other amino acids with an excess of the uh, amino groups, uh, lysine for example. The, uh, it's quite possible to get really what amounts to another uh, amide or peptide linkage between the uh, two uh, independent polypeptide groups. Also, if these do not exactly react to form a peptide or an amide linkage, uh, they can pick up the uh, charges. The uh, amino group, as you know, usually exists as a charged uh, 
uh, in a charged form, and the carboxyl group, of course, will exist as the uh, can exist as the uh, ionized form, and we can have, in essence, what amounts to a, a salt formation. The, in other words, the group carrying the uh, proton can approach fairly close to the carboxylate group and actually form a salt linkage. And then a bond of a lower uh, class of energy is the old hydrogen bond. Uh, of course, this uh, is a very easily formed bond. We have a proton here. And uh, if we get approach here of a carboxyl, uh, carbonyl group from the carboxylate uh, end of uh, uh, one of the other uh, peptides, we can actually form a weak hydrogen bond between the uh, nitrogen and the oxygen. This is a fairly low energy bond, but there are lots of opportunities along the peptide chain for these to form. If we have conformation of two peptides, uh, we might get as many as uh, oh, a dozen or two of these hydrogen bonds formed in a fairly short distance, and the cumulative bonding power or energy would be uh, significant. It would still be of an order lower than the formation of an amide bond or of the uh, uh, dithio bond. Now, since these bonds are of relatively low energy, uh, they are easily disrupted. And this accounts for the fact that uh, proteins in wines and in other solutions or other systems are not particularly stable. Uh, proteins, of course, come in two general types, the uh, what are called simple proteins. These are the ones made up of nothing but uh, polypeptide chains. And then the complex or conjugated proteins, which uh, have uh, other phosphorus or sulfur or uh, uh, other uh, atoms, uh, compounds containing other atoms uh, in conjugation with the uh, uh, peptides. The, uh, this is a rather artificial uh, classification. When you, if you hydrolyze the protein and you wind up nothing, with nothing but amino acids, you say that it's a simple protein. If you get some phosphorus or sulfur compounds, you say it's a conjugated protein. Uh, examples are, of course, the albumin from uh, egg white is a, a simple protein. You hydrolyze it, you get nothing but uh, amino acids. Globulins, on the other hand, which are uh, also include the types of proteins that are in grapes and wines, uh, you do find uh, that you get some phosphorus and other compounds on hydrolysis. The uh, simple proteins in general tend to be soluble in uh, <coughs> pure water. The more complex or conjugated proteins uh, are not likely to be as soluble in pure water, but uh, require some salts or a little uh, acid or base for their solubility. The, uh, another example of the conjugated proteins is uh, casein. This one uh, contains quite a bit of uh, phosphorus-containing compounds. Now, proteins in solution are rather complex materials simply because they are so large. They are large enough that uh, the surface, uh, well, the properties due to the interface between the molecule itself and the solution become important. If we consider a small molecule such as sucrose, the, uh, the 
volume of the sucrose molecule is so small that uh, it's, uh, we can't distinguish the bulk of the molecule from its surface. When we get to a protein, though, of two or three million, the uh, properties uh, generated by the surface interactions, the interface between the molecule and the solution, uh, become important. The, uh, of course, this is nothing other than saying that proteins are uh, colloidal particles. They have a size large enough that uh, they behave as uh, colloids. The uh, proteins are, because they do contain the amino group and the carboxylate group, are amphoteric. They can, uh, in acid solutions, they behave as uh, slightly basic. In basic solutions, the carboxylate group behaves as an acid. Uh, we define what is called an isoelectric point for any protein as the point where the charges are balanced. And uh, this becomes important for uh, several reasons. If you're analyzing the proteins in the laboratory, this is the point at which, the, uh, since the charges are balanced, the protein will migrate neither to the uh, cathode or anode when you try to uh, uh, separate it from other components by electrophoresis. Also, <coughs> the uh, isoelectric point is a point of uh, minimum solubility for the protein. So that uh, in some cases, this becomes important in the wine, in winery with wines if we change the uh, pH of the solution and thus come closer to the isoelectric point of a particular protein, we may induce uh, instability and uh, precipitation. The uh, pH, the isoelectric pH, of course, will shift a little bit with the uh, changes in uh, ionic strength of the solution and uh, with the type of uh, uh, metal salts that are in the solution. Well, these are secondary effects and usually uh, do not uh, cause much trouble in the winery. Uh, now we should talk a little bit about uh, the denaturation and uh, flocculation. These are two different concepts. Denaturation is the term that describes what happens when uh, uh, the protein loses its original degree of solubility. And uh, what this amounts to as far as structure is that some of the cross-linking bonds are broken and uh, the folded nature or the rigid structure of the large protein molecule is altered. Usually from uh, electron microscopic studies, we know what happens is that the the protein really begins to unfold a little bit. Instead of having its compact, uh, definite structure, uh, it begins to uh, get longer chains of uh, polypeptides, which are just wandering around. <laughs> and they're still hooked onto the main part that is not yet denatured. The, uh, in many cases, the, uh, you don't see any change in the solubility if you're far enough above the uh, point of precipitation with this denaturation. And the only way you can detect denaturation is by, well, microscopic studies or more usually uh, measurements of change of viscosity. The, uh, as the molecule unfolds and gets these uh, longer 
well, tail like uh, uh, pieces of polypeptide hanging out, the viscosity increases significantly. The, uh, as the denaturation process continues, the protein loses all of its uh, uh, structure, the, uh, it usually will flocculate, which is a term meaning to form or precipitate, and drop out of solution. The uh, denaturation <coughs> can be caused by a number of factors. The, uh, I'm sure you can see this from the fact that we emphasize the dithio bond as a relatively weak bond. The amide bond between chains is a strong bond, but the salt uh, bridge bond is a relatively weak one, and the hydrogen bond also is a uh, much weaker bond. So we'd expect that uh, uh, relatively minor external influences might cause denaturation. We find this is true. Uh, a little bit of heat, in some cases nothing but uh, vigorous shaking or stirring of a protein solution is enough to denature it. Uh, UV light, such as uh, you get in the sunshine, uh, very frequently will denature proteins. Uh, an ultrasonic generator is usually enough to uh, disrupt the bonds and cause the denaturation. Uh, the addition of acids, strong acids or strong bases, organic solvents, uh, heavy metal cations such as copper, lead, uh, uranium, molybdenum uh, will usually denature the protein. And not surprisingly, uh, the uh, detergents that we uh, use also are very good protein denaturants. You might not expect this until you remember that uh, our uh, detergents are tailored, designed to uh, uh, handle uh, uh, dirty dishes, dirty clothes, and things of this time, type that have a rather high protein uh, contaminant. And we want a material that will denature and uh, remove the protein. So this is how the detergent does function. In uh, heat denaturation, the, uh, we get no change in the uh, balance of charges on the different parts of the protein. But the, uh, we get uh, some breakage particularly of the hydrogen bonds and uh, perhaps some of the uh, dithio bonds. The uh, denaturation by shaking or violent uh, stirring where you get a shearing, high shearing action in the liquid. Uh, here you have a good uh, example of if you're making hollandaise sauce or making mayonnaise, uh, what you're doing is uh, denaturing the egg in the, uh, or denaturing the protein in the egg and forming an emulsion with the oil and the vinegar or lemon juice. And uh, uh, it's amazing how uh, you, when you think about cooking and household operations, how often we're dealing with these proteins. The, uh, uh, the shearing action or shaking is uh, a mechanical breakage, again, probably of the hydrogen bonds. But what is happening usually in this case is uh, that the, the uh, polypeptides are distributed as a monomolecular film over the uh, little globule of oil or vinegar or lemon juice in the hollandaise sauce or the mayonnaise. And uh, in case it's a wine, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> you can actually uh, form 
an emulsion if you, uh, in some cases, you can actually stabilize uh, protein in the wine by running it through a, a centrifugal pump. And uh, what you're getting is this uh, formation of the stabilization of the colloid, the protein forming uh, uh, little films over uh, some of the uh, less soluble uh, glycerol or gum or material of that type. And uh, when this happens, it frequently is difficult to uh, clarify the wine later on. The uh, effect of ultraviolet light, of course, is easily explainable. Uh, UV light has a high intensity of radiation at uh, from 270 up to about 400 uh, nanometers. The uh, the shorter wavelength light is uh, absorbed readily by the uh, uh, benzene or substituted benzene rings in the uh, amino acids ring of tyrosine, phenylalanine, tryptophan. And uh, the energy uh, is trapped in the ring, but it uh, breaks the bonds uh, adjacent to the ring. So this really disrupts uh, the protein or the polypeptide structure uh, pretty drastically. The uh, longer wavelength, three to 400 nanometers, causes uh, photooxidation probably uh, through uh, formation of peroxy groups and attack on the uh, uh, hydrogen bond or the uh, salt bonds or the dithio bonds uh, of the protein structure. The uh, ultrasonic energy, of course, can function in many ways. Uh, there is a mechanical uh, action would be akin to the uh, shearing forces generated by shaking or pumping or stirring, but also, of course, uh, ultrasonic energy shows up in a, an aqueous system as uh, heat through the agitation of the water uh, molecule dipole itself. And then, of course, uh, depending on the energy, uh, the intensity of the uh, ultrasound, you can actually form oxygen or peroxy radicals from water. And these, of course, then attack the uh, peptide structure and break it down. Uh, mineral acids or bases, of course, would function most effectively in breaking the uh, salt bridges between the, uh, the NH3 plus group and the uh, carboxylate group of an adjacent chain, since they would uh, neutralize one or the other and simply break the bond. Organic solvents, uh, such as ethanol, uh, cause splitting of the protein, can cause breakdown, and formation of new complexes. They do this through the uh, effect on the uh, ionic strength, uh, through, excuse me, not on ionic strength, but on the dipole moment. The, uh, uh, this is uh, an effect of the dielectric constant of ethanol as compared with water. Uh, heavy metal ions uh, seem to function in acid solutions in two ways. They can function as a catalyst for uh, oxygen transfer and breakdown, thus the oxidation of the protein. Or they can form complexes or insoluble salts, so that you have quite a, a range of ways in which the uh, copper, iron, and uh, other heavy metals, if they are there, 
can act. Uh, anionic, anionic detergents in acid solutions, of course, can combine with the protein, uh, reacting with the uh, cationic groups on the uh, peptides. Uh, denaturation, thus, can cause this uh, unfolding or breakdown in the uh, complicated structure of the protein, and uh, it results in exposing a lot more of the uh, reactive sites uh, of the on the uh, side chain uh, amino acid groups than were uh, available for reaction in the more complicated folded structure. In other words, if you open the thing up, make it a like a long string of uh, polypeptides, all of the reactive groups, in theory, are going to be available for uh, interaction. The, uh, for this reason, of course, the solubility changes, as we mentioned earlier. The uh, uh, If the, and as I mentioned earlier, if the pH is near the isoelectric point, the uh, result is likely to be uh, coagulation and precipitation. The, uh, this is not always the case. If the uh, denaturation is uh, mild and if the effect is removed frequently, the protein will re-fold itself or restructure itself and we'll never see uh, any precipitation. We would never know that there was any denaturation unless we measured uh, viscosity change or something of this order. Now let's talk a little bit about what actually occurs during this flocculation and precipitation. Um, we mentioned the uh, um, change due to organic solvents. The equation that expresses the force between uh, two molecules in a solution can be written in which the force between these two charged particles is, proportion to, is proportional to the charge on the two particles, product of their charges, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them and the dielectric constant of the medium. Okay, here's where the uh, effect of the water comes in because we know that uh, eta, the dielectric constant for water, is about 80, that's at 20 degrees centigrade, and for, for ethanol, it, what is it, 23. So, if we go from a, a wine of 12% alcohol by fortification up to about 20%, uh, uh, we can alter the dielectric constant enough to uh, reduce the force between the molecules uh, significantly. The, uh, also, of course, once this denaturation has occurred, uh, as with most solutions, when we lower the temperature, the solubility decreases. So if, we're, uh, if we denature a protein, don't see any precipitate immediately, if we cool the solution, we may, we may find that we get precipitation. And Further, 
since proteins are least soluble at their isoelectric point, if we change the pH by blending two solutions, two wines, we may get precipitation here, even though the denatured proteins were still in solution. Protein in solution also is extremely sensitive to ionic strength. Ionic strength is a measure of the charged particles in solution. Uh, if we change uh, the acidity, put in a little citric acid, for instance, hoping to complex the iron, or uh, if we uh, change the, uh, if we blended two wines of different uh, uh, extract, one having a higher uh, uh, alkalinity of the ash, in other words, neutral salts in solution, we may find that uh, the solubility of our protein would uh, change drastically, whereas in the two individual wines, it would be uh, quite stable in solution. The mixture, because of the different ionic strength, would uh, precipitate. Finally, of course, the proteins can be induced to precipitate out by uh, combination with other substances. The, uh, we've talked about alterations of the uh, salt mixture and uh, that kind of thing, but uh, if uh, we, this doesn't apply to wines, but uh, uh, a Substance such as trichloroacetic acid and certain other substances are capable of forming insoluble uh, complexes with proteins, or salts really, and uh, they will precipitate out. Another case that doesn't apply to wines, if we're on the alkaline side of the isoelectric point in proteins, we actually get precipitates with the uh, uh, heavy metals or heavy metal oxides. The, uh, usually the uh, complex or precipitated that is formed, uh, the solubility is inversely proportional to the molecular weight and uh, to the charge carried by the particle. Solubility factors, temperature, pH, ionic strength, dielectric constant, the degree of denaturation, the amount, kind, and state of other substances present. present. Uh, the Types of proteins that we find in uh, grapes and wines, these globular, are globular proteins, vegetable type proteins. Uh, usually they're only moderately soluble in water. Solubility is increased by presence of low concentrations of neutral salts. And uh, this is an effect well, a secondary effect because of the uh, <coughs> electrostatic ion, uh, action on the ionized groups of the, on the external surface of this uh, ball-like, sphere-like protein. The, uh, with the denaturation, uh, as I said earlier, this sphere or ball opens up a lot more groups become uh, available for reaction, and uh, the uh, uh, usual reaction or usual uh, occurrence is a flocculation and precipitation following the denaturation. Um, 
An example of this type of action is the uh, combination of heavy metals with uh, sulfhydryl groups. Uh, normally, in the uh, globular protein, these would be well, all tied together in diethyl linkages inside of the uh, uh, spherical structure. When the thing is denatured and opened up, these sulfhydryl groups, the SH group, can interact to form a, a sulfur copper or sulfur lead or sulfur iron or whatever it is type of uh, salt. And uh, uh, this then leads to uh, uh, flocculation and precipitation. In wines, we find that uh, there is normally only a small amount of protein. This is probably a very good thing. It ranges from about two up to the order of 100 parts per million. Uh, even though the level of the proteins is small, they are involved in a lot of the problem in clouding in white wines. Uh, this is so because these white wines, of course, are water ethanol solutions of amino acids, peptides, the neutral salts, acid salts, uh, acids, tannins, pigments, and uh, a few heavy metal cations which can interact. Uh, in addition, of course, we do a lot of things to wines that uh, cause denaturation and flocculation. Did you have a question? Why is there a problem in reds? Reds, usually we get the protein, uh, most of it precipitated out during the fermentation with the excess of uh, tannin. Occasionally, very occasionally, a light red will show a problem, but usually not. The, uh, things that we do to wines, of course, we change the temperatures, we uh, pump them, we uh, run them through fining operations, filtrations, and uh, occasionally we put in things like sulfur dioxide and a little citric acid. Now, under, because of the various way the different proteins react, because of the uh, very different solubilities under these different conditions. Sometimes we get no uh, denaturation or no flocculation anyway. In other cases, we get uh, a very uh, heavy precipitate with very slight uh, treatment. The, uh, what we've talked about previously, of course, can be applied to uh, the problem of getting protein stability. The, uh, we can really look at wines as a case of uh, protein in uh, semi-stable equilibrium. Now, what we want to do is get it to market in a state such that uh, it's far enough uh, removed from the uh, point of precipitation that it won't cause trouble while it's on the shelf before the customer has drunk it. So what we want to do is uh, uh, choose conditions, either uh, remove the excess of the protein, remove the tannin, or remove the heavy metals that are likely to cause the instability. One of the easiest ways to do the removal of the protein is by uh, the, well, the older technique was by heating, which you remember denatured and caused flocculation. Then if you filtered, you would re remove most of the protein. But we all know that uh, heating is not a good treatment for uh, white table wines. So uh, what we use is bentonite, uh, as a fining agent. The bentonite adsorbs the protein and uh, removes most of it. There are some cases in which uh, 
uh, bentonite does not pick out the uh, particular protein fraction that we want. And in this case, we may be forced to uh, use the heating or uh, PVP, polyvinyl pyrrolidone, uh, fining. The uh, potassium ferrocyanide and QFEX, you remember from the last lecture, also remove a certain amount of protein. <coughs> The, uh, for tannins, the only really effective uh, agent for removal is uh, a gelatin fining. And uh, for white wines, this is a dangerous procedure because you can very easily uh, get the gelatin uh, stabilized in the solution. In other words, gelatin is a protein, and actually you wind up, instead of taking out a little bit of the tannin that might have caused a problem, you wind up with a stabilized uh, high protein white wine due to the gelatin that you put in. And when this happens, of course, you have to go back, either add tannin, which is not a good idea because it uh, is likely to brown or oxidize things, but you can take out the gelatin with PVP. So in general, uh, for light white wines, uh, don't try gelatin finings. This leaves the only other effective uh, preventative uh, reduction of the heavy metal <coughs> cations, particularly the iron and the copper. Of course, we know that these can be removed with QFEX, but the uh, better procedure is simply to avoid getting heavy metals into the wine uh, after the fermentation. Procedures then recommended are first someplace in the early stabilization of the wine, a filtration to remove protective colloids, fining with bentonite, a racking or coarse filtration off of the bentonite lees, refrigeration with filtration at the uh, low temperature, and then if uh, we're still having protein <coughs> instability, treatment with QFEX to take out uh, heavy metals if this is necessary. If we find after this treatment that the wine still shows protein instability, the, uh, about the only thing that can be done is to uh, heat it to, uh, no, excuse me, cool it to uh, about 45, fairly low temperature, fine again with bentonite, and uh, filter at the low temperature. Some, apparently, some wines will go through this first sequence of operations, leaving uh, some protein in solution, which then is susceptible to uh, adsorption with bentonite at the low temperature. Uh, just what goes on uh, is not completely clear. Then, having... Uh, reduce the protein level. We want to get the wine to market without uh, uh, denaturing the amount of protein that is there. Of course, uh, what this means is that we should avoid any blending or any <coughs> additions of tannin or any contamination with metals uh, after this protein stabilization. I think you all understand this by now that uh, the uh, the blending and the first the big adjustments for color acid and so forth come early in the processing of the wine the protein stabilization comes shortly before we go to the uh, bottle filtering that is the bottling operation the uh, uh, millipore filtering and bottling 
One other point, of course, that we must be especially careful of is to avoid detergent pickup in the uh, uh, final bottling or final filtration before bottling. Detergents, you remember, can cause denaturation and flocculation. And this one is very difficult, but the, uh, <coughs> the gentler the bottling operation can be, the less likely we're to have uh, mechanical denaturation of any protein that is left. In other words, we should avoid very uh, violent uh, agitation, uh, filtrations, or aerations during the uh, uh, bottling operation itself. Heat is a bad thing, not only from the point of view of the flavor, but also from denaturation of the protein. So after the wine has been stabilized, keep it cool. <coughs> and then finally, to avoid uh, light denaturation, we uh, should keep the wine out of sunlight, certainly, and in subdued lights. Brown bottles are uh, best. Green bottles and white bottles, unfortunately, transmit almost the same amount of uh, UV light. And uh, they're not, well, if you use green bottles, you might as well <coughs> consider you using a white bottle and you that you've got to keep the wine out of light. In other words, if you case it right away and stack cases for aging, this perhaps is the uh, best way to protect the wine from light. Then uh, Berg finished up by saying that uh, measurements of total protein content of the wine is a poor index of whether it's going to, uh, you're going to get protein instability or not because the different proteins, different fractions, behave in different manners. That uh, of the four fractions that uh, they've isolated in the lab over here, one was completely stable to heat, while the other three varied quite a bit in their heat sensitivity. OK, I think that about finishes. Uh, you, you mentioned avoiding uh, too much agitation in the wine. Mm -hmm. Is no more filtering a problem in reducing protein going on? Well, I'm sure that it could be. If you were just uh, on the borderline of uh, instability, uh, millipore filtration could be a uh, uh, problem because you're certainly subjecting to the wine, the wine to quite a, an intense uh, shearing <coughs> force, making it go through those little holes. 